You may have heard the saying that if you don't train legs, then you don't even lift. Although a bit extreme, I agree with the sentiment that there are certain lessons that can only be acquired through developing strong and jacked legs. In this video, I'll describe exactly what those are. Starting with why gym bros are so reluctant in training their legs to begin with. There's two primary reasons. The first being the fact that they're honest with themselves. Let's keep it real. Most of you did not get started with lifting in order to have amazing quad separation and graininess. Tree trunks was not the first thing in mind. It was always, let's get jacked in the upper body. Guns hugging the sleeves, watermelon pecs, V taper, flexing, looking aesthetic. And the leanness always refers to the upper body muscles, like the abs, like the bicep and tricep separation, like the details, the Christmas tree. And anyone who says otherwise is probably lying. I'm sure there's some freak outliers here and there who maybe always had jack legs from playing given sport, like football, but most lifters, and I would say that this still holds true to this day and will probably always be this way, wanna be insanely jacked in the upper body like a freaking superhero, like a Hollywood actor, like a bodybuilder, and have legs that are well muscled but not overly developed, says me. So that's the first reason. The second, which is actually very common and goes hand in hand with this, which is the focus of today's video, is the fact that leg training is brutally difficult. Quite possibly the most gruesome day of the week, or in general, any leg exercise you do will beat you to the ground. There's no shortcuts, and no matter how much you try to optimize your training, choosing the most efficient exercises, biomechanically sound, pain is inevitable. You will suffer always, because that's what it takes to equalize the muscle gains. You want bodybuilder level legs? Man, you're in for something else because the pain is easily twice as much. And it's not a thing about work capacity. It's the fact that your legs are so much bigger. The cross-sectional area that force production goes up exponentially to the point where the absolute loads themselves with the range of motion and the overall fatigue that's generated from leg training will have you feeling it every single time. At least if you're past the novice face. Now, a simple way to view this is by examining muscle measurements. How many of you have legs that are 10 inches bigger than your arms? That's common and is to be expected after a certain point. So if you have 15 inch arms, your legs can easily be 25. You got 17s, your legs can be 27 inches. Certainly, that's been the case for me. It's exactly that much apart. You know, maybe minus two or plus two, but that's the ballpark range. Now, because of this massive size difference, it's obviously gonna manifest in the compound movements. Most typically, if we talk about squat bench dead, about a plate apart, but it could be even more. That's why you've all heard the simple standard three plate bench, four plate squat, five plate deadlift. It's not by accident. And so between the bench and the dead, there's about a 200 pound difference. And between the squat, about 100 pounds, depending on the lifter now, assuming you weren't lazy like your boy. So, all things being equal, yes, proportionally speaking, your legs are bigger, you can handle more weight, that's the natural course of how things function. But, the way those weights feel on your back, on your body, all that, is not the same. Ball Alley Man put it best. Whether you squat four or 500 pounds, when you put three plates on your back, it's still going to feel heavy because 315 is 315. Likewise, I can bench 405, but when I have three plates in my hands on the bench, trust me, it's never going to feel light unless you're maximally hyped up, which overrides the pain. You're high on pre-workouts or in a flow state by which you don't really notice it as much, but it's still there. With legs, it always feels heavy. And that is a big deal because psychologically, you have to overcome weights that you are able to hit, but feel difficult every single time. What I mean is, if I have you doing three sets of 10 at 70% on a bench press, maybe the last two and a half reps or so, that's when the reps start to slow down. So you go from moderate difficulty to boom, instant spike where you're just weak. All your strength is sapped away. Whereas on things like squats, and keep in mind this discussion goes beyond the barbell version, could be hack squats, leg press, etc. is difficult from the first three reps. Meaning, you can be at RPE 3, yet 
you still got seven more reps of pain. Tell me if you guys can relate. It takes longer to do the set. You have to reclaim your breath, get tight, make sure your form is even more solid since it's more technical. There's more muscles involved. Not only the quads and the glutes, but also the spinal rectus. Everything's gotta be rigid like a stiff, you know what. You tell me if that doesn't make a difference. And then you got this weight pressing down on your spine, compressing you. The cardiovascular component, the pumps that generally tend to be unreal. You notice how when guys are doing a set of squats, they're gasping for air? They're limping like a handicapped person because their spinal erectors are pumped with blood and their quads feel like they're being torn off the bone? This is real stuff. When you see Dr. Mike and his crew lying down on the floor, dead, man, I've been in that situation so many times. This is to be expected if you train hard. Now, if you're doing some low RPE shit or are training like a powerlifter, you're not doing higher reps, bodybuilder style, then sure, I, I can understand why you may not feel that as much. But you do reps with a high proximity failure, that's what's gonna happen. Whereas, you can do that on bench all day. You're freaking good. Basically, there's more out of less weight as it pertains to upper body only, and then there's more out of less weight when we compare lower to upper. And what I can tell you is that with lower body training, it scales a lot worse. What I mean is, if I want to bench press with a straight bar, the minimum standard for reps is going to be 275. But if I do an incline bench or the camber bar bench, or I stick to variations that make me lose minimum 10% strength, then I might be under 250 pounds. This is very possible. And therefore I can better manage the stimulus of the ratio. Whereas with legs, they're so much bigger and stronger that you almost always have to go at three plates and above, even when using really low percentages. So it gets to a point where fatigue is basically always high. So if I wanna get a good leg workout in with a straight bar, I can't do anything less than 315. But in many cases, it's gonna be around 340-ish. And if I wanna go heavy, unfortunately, and this sucks balls, I have to squat at least 405. Why? Because I did 405 for 9 reps along a 507 squat. So why would I do anything less? Of course, this has serious implications. Four plates is always heavy and is psychologically defeating. It could be quite scary when you have 8 45 pound plates on the bar. Even when you know you can lift a lot more than that. Because it's easily twice your body weight and beyond as well as always feeling heavy from the start to the end of the set. And compared to what you would do with upper body lifts, it's so much higher that the recovery itself is an independent stressor. So if you're training your upper and lower body equally, yet twice a week, you're going well over 100 pounds more than what you can press, row, etc. Do you not think that this is going to have an effect on your net recovery? Of course it will. It might be different muscles, but it's the same nervous system and you feel that fatigue throughout the week. And that's why when we talk about stimulus fatigue, it matters even more so with lower body training. And when we talk about Dela specifically, it gets even worse because if you're pulling in the fives, then your back down work is going to be somewhere in the fours, but that's still a heavy ass weight. You know, in my case, I'm doing four and a half plates on the RDL. It'd be nice to get more or less weight, but you get so strong that at some point, it becomes not possible. And that's the biggest factor here. Your legs can get so jacked and strong that eventually, the pain is going to worsen as well as how you feel throughout the week. And that's why a lot of guys stop setting standards for themselves because it gets a little bit too psychotic, not only mentally, but physically. So. If you can get to that point where you are elite in the lower body, trust me, that's gonna turn you into a freaking man, at least in a lifting context. There's nothing you can't handle at that point. And what I can say is, after going through this journey, being lazy for years, and then finally overcoming it, I now realize how little effort I was actually putting in. Because just doing 50% of a leg workout is about 100% of an upper body workout. Everything from the difficulty of the movements, the pump, the pain, 
as well as the work capacity factor. Now, I consider myself to be a fit guy. I've done extensive cardio throughout my life and will continue doing so. And I want to bring you more GPP content. But when you're doing brutal volume on legs, you're kind of out of breath and you do need more rest time compared to upper body stuff. Don't think for a second it's going to be the same. Heck, your accessory work, which is considered to be the easy stuff, will be about the same level of rest needed compared to upper body compound movements. Meaning, if I bench press, I'm physically ready after two minutes. I'm not out of breath or gassed out or overly pumped. I'm good, right? But I'm going to take that extra minute just because I'm following the science, right? Whereas with legs, after two minutes, I actually don't feel ready. It's by three where I'm just, just. But if I were to rest a little bit more, then that'd probably be better. So it can easily be at least a minute or two more to get yourself ready for the next set, which further proves the difficulty of lower body training. I'm not gonna lie. When I'm doing barbell back squats for reps, going to failure super close to it, I need at least five minutes of rest between sets. That's the difference I'm talking about here. And so if you're used to constantly pushing it, what happens when you go back to training upper body? You're flying through it. It feels like a freaking warm up. And these days, I'd say that's generally the case. Upper body training is not that difficult anymore. It used to be because I didn't train my legs, but now I can understand why the old school greats were so big on movements like squats and deads and in general, just building those freaking tree trunks. It's not because of testosterone release. It's not because your biceps are gonna grow from squats. Really, it's your yoke that's gonna improve the most, but beyond actual muscles, it's the resiliency, the grit, the ability to strain. These are all universal things. If you're able to grind through a deadlift, you can grind through a bench. It doesn't matter that it's upper versus lower body. It's the physical straining that you must undergo. Now with legs, that's always gonna be more. And again, it explains why most lifters don't go to failure on very basic movements. How come you rarely see a guy failing on a leg press? Is it because he's scared the weight's gonna come crashing down, his knees into his face? No. It's because it takes that extra effort. But once you can develop it, all I'm saying is, it's gonna help you in all facets of fitness. Heck, even when we talk about percentages, there will be times where you don't believe in yourself because the numbers seem so absurdly high, but when you just trust the math, go for it regardless, you quickly realize that you've been capable this entire time. The set goes much smoother than you anticipate, which not only teaches you the power of mindset, but also develops immense confidence. You start to realize that you limit yourself in most cases. An example, there was one workout where I prescribed 85% of my one rep max, and it was the end of the week. And when I looked at the number, I'm like, yo, this is impossible. There's not a chance in hell. Like, surely the percentage has to be off. Even though I was basing off a real provable max, it wasn't an estimation. I'm looking at the back down, I'm like, this can't be, I'm going to fail this weight. I didn't have an ounce of confidence in me, but I said, you know what? I got my safety pins on. Worst case, it goes crashing down. I'm gonna be all right. So I went in with this belief, but after the first rep, I'm like, yo, this is moving well. Second, it's smooth. Third, it goes up. I ended up getting five reps that day with 375, and I posted it on Instagram as well. Didn't think it was gonna happen, honestly because that's not even a weight that I was regularly lifting. I was in percentages way below that. And because the percentages scale so differently with legs, you might see a 50 pound jump as something that's unreasonable, but in actuality, you are able. So that's what I'm saying, you overcome your own delusions. And then eventually this anxiety you might feel goes away because you trust yourself. Experience has shown that as long as you keep your ego in check, you're putting accurate numbers now then you will be able to lift this, even if it does seem a little bit out there. And that's something that is much harder to do with legs because of how strong you can become. So eventually, weights that were once thought to be heavy, which actually are, will be viewed in an average light. Does this make sense, guys? You can handle so much more in your upper body when your legs are strong. Take the overhead press. You're standing up with the weight in your hands, your core is contracted, upper back, spinal erectors, it's all involved, it's rather unstable, right? Well, if you can front squat three plates or more, then what's 200 pounds? 
still a very impressive weight to OHP, but in terms of what your core feels, the overall balance component, the straining on the support tissues, it's nothing. Therefore, you won't be as limited to these potential limiting muscles. All right, a man who's paid his dues for serious leg training can quite honestly handle anything that the gym has to offer. And that's why you should all train your legs. It's not about the appearance factor because I perfectly understand that we don't all have the same goals. And even now, I have to look at my legs and say that I'm not a fan of the X-Taper physique. I don't think I ever will be. It's just a personal preference. I like old school V-Taper aesthetics where your legs are between 25 and 26 inches. Still very impressive, jacked, separated, all that, but they don't go so excessively past the hip or in general, not so large that you end up being somewhat bottom heavy or similar to your actual back width. You always want the opposite, like a cartoon, if you ask me. But you know, that's another thing. Some guys might find the opposite to be true once they do train their legs hard. You might discover that you really like the look, but if you make excuses before that point, before you even paid your dues, then you're missing out on something that could have made you much happier. Not to mention all the other benefits I listed. So that's why everyone should strive to acquire tree trunks. And along that journey, if you get really close to it, you're like, you know what, this ain't for me. Then you can always go into maintenance mode or back down a little bit. But if you're nowhere near there, then to me, that's not the proper way. So although we can have subjective aesthetic goals, that doesn't change the training that we have to go through. Everyone needs to train their legs hard unless they're seriously injured. And that's how you're gonna get respect from the fitness community. If I shrink my legs a little bit and decide to go into marathon running or in general change my goals, I don't think anyone would mind it because they know that I already got the elite numbers with the jacked measurements to go with it. It's why no one says anything about Greg Doucette's legs. Dude went into biking, definitely lost mass, can barely even squat four plates these days but it doesn't matter because they know his accomplishments. And that's all I'm trying to say. Make something out of yourself first before you decide to specialize in something else. It's like when we talk about building a base. You know, you get past the novice phase. You acquire those first 10 plus pounds of muscle. Make sure you're strong at the big three, the basic barbell movements, some little accessories here and there. You know, the shit that people have been practicing for decades, right? You build your foundation and then you deviate away if necessary, right? Same thing with legs. I want all of you to hit intermediate, which in vague generalized terms is gonna be a three plate squat and four plate deadlift. But in actuality, it's when linear progression ceases, but I don't care. Everyone should be able to lift those numbers. After that, you do what you want, but don't skip when there's nothing to show for. So with that said, let's end off on the topic of leg training templates. What you'll eventually realize is that what builds a majority of your mass is focusing on simple knee flexions and hip hinges meaning squats and deadlifts, but not the powerlifting variations. For squats, it's going to be something that's quad bias, so not a low bar hip dominant squat. It'll instead be high bar or heel elevated SSB, where there's tremendous knee flexion, that tibia is going all the way forward. Could even be a hack squat or belt squat. Point is, the squat is the king of lower body movements. That should be the most important exercise, period. And then the hip hinge will develop the backside, the spinal rectors, glutes, and hamstrings to its highest degree. And I recommend something that is not dead stop. That is what a deadlift is. It is a dead stop hip hinge. Instead, if your goal is bodybuilding, you wanna do Romanian deadlifts or good mornings. Many variations of those, whatever suits your preferences. Could be trap bar RDLs, straight bar, dumbbell, good morning, could be with the SSB, high bar straight, low bar, whatever. I don't care what you do, the point is, 80% of your mass is probably gonna come from those two movement patterns alone. And that's just me keeping it real. As someone who really does believe in maximalism, don't get me wrong, I love unilateral work. Lunges have done so much for my legs. Bulgarian split squats, sissy squats, leg extensions, leg curls. We have to do this additional stuff to further refine the muscles, especially to develop the rectus femoris and the other head of the hamstring, which you actually need isolated knee flexion, right? That's all valid. But those areas don't need a tremendous amount of work to correct. And like I said, I'm talking about your base mass, the majority. So of course, leg training will always be difficult, but you don't need anything extravagant. Oftentimes, a simple approach is better. And I do think that the strength training world had it right when discussing 
basic knee flexions and hip hinges. That's something that'll never go away. It's been proven time and time again to be one of the best methods. And in my opinion, it is. And that's it guys. Those are some of the lessons you'll learn from really focusing on your legs. Hope you enjoyed this video and I want to hear your feedback. What else do you have to share on this topic? Let's hear it and I'll talk to you all next time.